In 2014, Glasgow hosted one of the most successful Commonwealth Games ever. Quickly dubbed the Friendly Games, visitors from far and wide were met with a dazzling opening show at Celtic Park. But, as the East End basked in the glory of the Games, many people were unaware of the community in the shadow of the Parkhead Stadium. This is Barrowfield, a small scheme in the East End of Glasgow, whose reputation for gangs, violence and poverty has, over the years, become infamous. I was born in Glasgow in the Rotten Row Hospital, born and bred in Barrowfield in the East End of Glasgow. Um, lived there all my life. I mean, Barrowfield is known as one of the most poverty-stricken areas in Europe and has been you know, over the last 50, 60 years. There was loads of gangs down there, and they were fighting, young men fighting, most, most weekends. Um, it, you know, most of the young guys you would pass in the street had a chip mark. Um, but, you know, most of them have had previous convictions. Um, levels of knife crime were, were, were high. I was raised in Barrowfield till I was about 10. And my re recollection of Barrowfield is just bad memories through violence. It was just a circle of violence. Every time you looked out your window, there was gang fighting. And it never ended, it was just, and it got a bad reputation. And the reputation has stuck with the people of Barrowfield forever. Unfairly, because a lot of good people came out of this area. Much is known about the violence and poverty of the East End of Glasgow and the gangs that were synonymous with the area. But Barrowfield also has another story to tell. Barrowfield, an East End housing scheme. It was 1950 when John O'Brien had a dream. Saving his shillings to buy boxing gloves that day. For him and his friends, it was to be their legacy. Sparring sessions up a close, black eye, burst lip and a broken nose. But these boys were tough, they came back for more even though some were picked up off the floor. Wasn't long till they could bob and weave and fighting for Barrowfield with their heart on their sleeve. Barrowfield was one of Glasgow's first housing schemes. Built in the 1930s to ease the social problems that existed in the city's slums. By the time the 50s came round, boxing had become a popular working class sport in Britain, especially in the more deprived areas. It was a sport that offered an escape for many of the young boys in these impoverished communities. One boy in particular who recognised the importance of sport was John O'Brien. He would go on to have a significant influence on many of his young peers. This influence would be keenly felt by two of O'Brien's neighbours, the brothers, Bobby and Johnny Mallon. I was born in the Gorbals, Florence Street, 71 Florence Street. And during the war, we moved to Barrowfield and we lived in a single end. I was a one bedroom flat with three, four beds. And I think John O'Brien was two years older than us. He was always, he was always a kind of a bully, you know, and we all went to school together and we used to fight at school. And John O'Brien was always, everybody was scared of him. And he says to me, I've got a boxing club. And he said, but we're going to practice first before we go there. I said, but how can we practice? He said, I'm going to buy boxing gloves at the second hand shop. He said, they're only five shillings for the pair. So here he comes up the street with these boxing gloves on his shoulder. And I said, oh no. So anyway, up the close, O'Brien put the gloves on as it was maybe 10 or 12 years. And he used to, Bust her nose, bust her lips, you couldn't drink a cup of tea, your lips. Didn't even come with you, just... But that guy learnt us. You know, he taught us to be tough. In Barrowfield Street, we had Archie Drennan, Bobby Drennan and Joe Woodhouse. Joe Woodhouse was the Scottish featherweight champion. Then we left there, we go to Stamford Street, he had Sammy Harris, who was a youth champion. He had James Clark, who was a youth champion. Jim Costello, stayed at the top of Stamford Street. And then you had David McLean, who boxed for the meet who was an exceptional good fighter, but unfortunately never made it. But it really, I mean, that's only a wee, a wee bit of a half a mile radius, you know? And that was already boys all box. Bobby was two years younger than Johnny and, like his brother, wanted to fight. But, as a child, Bobby had many obstacles to face. 
He had difficulty walking and suffered from very poor eyesight. But these obstacles never stopped Bobby, and he started going to the gym and training with his brother. And very soon he too was getting fights. It wasn't long before Bobby would go further than the rest, carrying the hopes and the dreams of the community that raised him. When I first met Bobby, and he was younger, he was a very funny guy. Uh, a lot of mischief, always up to mischief, but fun. Bobby is just a, a wee comedian, very clever boxer. Uh, some people didn't, couldn't understand him because he was quite cheeky at times, but he wasn't he really. He was just that type of wee guy. I can only see nice things about Bobby, like, you know, there's nothing bad to say about him. And um, he had a good style. He had a real boxing style, like, you know, and he went on and done great. As far as the sparring goes, different class, you know, different class to me altogether, you know, so Jimmy Stevenson, who was the trainer at the time, he would only let me spar Bobby maybe two rounds, and then he would just call it a day, you know, because Bobby was really good. He was my friend three times, but my enemy three other times would beat me. So that's all, I mean, he was, he was an excellent fighter, great experience, and I learned a lot from him, boxing against him. We Bobby Mullen, well, he was a baby of the team, and uh, I looked after, but I think I looked after him, made sure he was getting well looked after. And uh, he, got, he was one of the best boxer flyers we ever had in Scotland at that time. Excitedly waiting for a Qantas airliner where more than 100 athletes and officials all bound for. As a five times Western District and ABA champion, Bobby would compete all over the world. In 1962, and aged only 18, he competed for a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games in Perth, Australia. Along with fellow Scotsmen and friends, John McDermott and Dick McTaggart, they hoped to bring back a gold medal for Scotland. Far from home and with the world watching, the pressure was on for these boys to prove they had it in them to win gold. No one said it was a terrific experience. Every team from the Commonwealth was there, eh, walking out onto this big stadium and the crowds, because the Scots in Perth were right behind us. You know, people who had emigrated to Australia, and you could hear them cheering and shouting in Scotland with the, the big flags out, you know, St Andrews and that. Well, when the finals were on, all the family were around the television, uh, lights out, dark. Bobby Marlin, was the first fight, flyweight. He opened up the, the tournament. We had butterflies, that's for sure. And Bobby came into the ring, and, he, and by, he was well supported there, by the way, believe it or not. And then when the first bell rang, it was a war. Catching the guy with left hands, left hands, left hooks, right hand, every punch in the boot. And then he, he done the, the cover hooks, and the guy couldn't hit him. And after the final whistle, we were all sitting there. How do you think he going? I said, I think Bobby's won it. The second fight's already gloved up, ready to get in the ring. I'm getting gloved up for my fight. And the next thing I can hear, Scotland the Brave coming from the arena. And I felt as if I was going through the roof. What a, what a G up it gave me. And he went over there and it was like, oh, unbelievable. It like, I couldn't explain it. I probably passed Bobby on the way in and he would come over and say to me, uh, all the best, John. And we're really proud because that's how I started off with a gold. I fought the Kenyan and beat him in points. A chap called Ali Juma. When I got a decision, I was calm. But I started to think of my parents right away. You were thinking about how, how they must feel. And that's what I was thinking about. They'll be, they'll be over the moon. Everybody from Barrowfield was just over them and, you know, and, oh, we Bobby's won a gold medal, and... But it's, it's hard to explain it, you know, because it's your brother, you know, and... to say, well, your brother's won a gold medal. And I think the next night after, they come home. I was doing it at the bottom of the cross. I didn't even know what they'd done. They'd put up, welcome home, Bobby. Congratulations. And the place all decorated. They had a bonfire. He had bagpipes, and it was 
Unbelievable, by the way. Brilliant. Bobby would go on to win many fights and titles, but his sparkling success was short-lived. After the highs of the Commonwealth Games, he seemed set to move into the professional ranks and earn a living from his passion. However, it was not to be. In an ill twist of fate, Bobby was denied his professional licence due to his poor eyesight. After this brutal blow, Bobby's marriage broke down and he slipped away from the public view. Uh, medically, it's a much safer, obviously, today's boxing. But in our day, I think it was much, much tougher as an amateur boxer in the 50s and 60s. They would have to just look at his record, look at the number of fights he's been in, look at all the number of years he's been boxing, you know? I think they were wrong at the time for uh, um, not giving him a licence. He boxed against every country he could mention, and yet they wouldn't let him turn professional because he had bad eyesight. And they should have banned if he boxed altogether. That's what I think, if, if he thought his eyesight was bad. To get to gold level standard means that you have um, a great amount of talent. You have really achieved something. I mean, we're not end away from amateurs against professionals. The point being that when you're professional, then it's, it's a career defining thing, it's a life defining thing. Um, but to, to achieve gold in, in any sport at any level is a wonderful achievement. I think if Bobby would have turned professional, he'd have a chance, like any other fighter, to become world champion. He'd have won a British title, he'd have won a European title with through any bother. But that world title would have been harder, but I think he'd have he'd, he'd enough in him to win it. I definitely do. I th you tend to find that when people uh, focus on a world championship, they become absolutely focused on it and things fall by the wayside. Even marriages have been known to fail because people are so determined or so in love with the sport that nothing else seems to matter at the time. Bobby used to stay in Easter House and he had a house and he was always in his cell. He was going to work, coming back, back in the house itself. Then he gave up the house and went to stay in the hostel, hostel in Brickton. And he knew people there and it was all people he was brought up with that he knew. He was meeting old friends from the 60s and the 70s. All the people that he grew up with and he felt like part of the community again. And it made him feel wanted. Because everybody knew him and feared him and I remember this and I remember it was all just reminiscing. And I think he just reminiscing carried on and he still was reminiscing to this day, man. Bobby's family have arranged a meeting with the chairman of the Scottish Boxing Hall of Fame, Matt Rooney, in order to find out more about Bobby's records. The records of amateur boxers is not very clear. I have been able to get bits and pieces. I heard a great story. Uh, Peter Harrison, I know Bobby beat Peter on one occasion, and Peter tells me that Bobby kept tapping him with his glove during the fight, and it was only after the fight that he found out it was because Bobby's eyesight was so bad that this was so he could find out where Peter was to hit him. That's right. That was him getting his distance. <laughs> he was pawing, pawing, he was pawing, a left hand. He used to box like that and he called it a cover hook. <laughs> yeah. Aye, uh, he, he, was, he was amazing. Amazing. Johnny, when I look at Bobby's record and I see he's won five Scottish titles, three of them at different weights, which is quite an achievement. He won an EBA title and he won a Commonwealth gold medal. And I look at some of the people he's actually beaten uh, who have gone on to have great careers as, as professional boxers. I, I think that Bobby, if it wasn't for his poor eyesight, could have been one of Scotland and indeed Britain's greatest fighters. The handling guy had me, Buddy Holly. Uh, I, my wife. My ex wife, Sandra, and that's my ma. And that's Tommy Gilmer, who was a big promoter. What can I say? It's great to look back. Johnny has come to visit his brother at his accommodation. He has brought with him some of Bobby's medals and awards, which he has held on to for safekeeping, as some have been stolen in the past. 
When the boys bullied you outside of school, who helped you? Aye, <laughs> you run away. <laughs> know what that is? That's your gold medal. I'll tell you something, Robert. Just be a photo of you in there, by the way. No, I don't should be, aye. Well, the, 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 the things are being a lynch. Bobby and Johnny are visiting the People's Palace, where for many years there was a memorial for the infamous boxer Benny Lynch. Lynch lived two doors down from Bobby and Johnny in the Gorbals, and like Bobby, Lynch spent his later years in homeless accommodation. Stories like Lynch's and Bobby's have become all too common for boxers of their generation. Glasgow was a violent city, and it was all too easy to go down the wrong road, as many of Bobby and Johnny's friends did. The Glasgow Ace has been going for maybe about eight years now. But it was dying away there, and I've just taken over three years ago. I'd like to go farm boxing, but my main focuses at the moment are school, you know. It's, it's like going to college or uni. Just doing a bit of boxing on the side. I just want to succeed in the amateur, have a good amateur career in my, well, as long as I can stay, then hopefully turn professional and see where I go from there. When I started boxing, I had nothing. It was brilliant. I was at the boxing every other night in the week, meeting the old professionals, sparring with them. It was great, and you'd learn. And it kept you off the streets. Nowadays, you've got to keep them off the streets. They end up in trouble. I had two pals, two of them done life for murder. One spent years in the jail. And nobody says to me, I can't want to go there. I wish I'd have done what you'd done, stuck to the boxing. You were either you had friends or you went fighting with people. So most of my friends went to the boxing and left the fighting to everybody else. We'd win on the way of fighting, but we were pals at the end of the day and nobody got scared or injured, basically. So boxing was a, a way of life for most young people in Barrafield. There wasn't anything to do in Barrafield growing up. Using, I suppose, what, what, what energy and could be a violent energy, an aggressive energy, to do things like their own wee karate clubs, boxing clubs. Both parents were um, addicted to drugs. You know, I, I was living um, a chaotic lifestyle and very often found myself in a position where I was taking somebody a square go. Nine times out of ten, it was somebody who was bigger than me, older than me, and I was made to fight them. Sometimes you would see those fights escalating to stabbing, slashing, shootings, murders. The success of the local boxers acted as a beacon for the younger boys in the community and steered many of them away from the gangs. But using sport as a way of combating youth crime is not new to schemes like Barrafield. After several generations, these methods are still in use today. In 2008, uh, we started a gangs project in East End of Glasgow and Barrowfield and other places in East End um, to reduce gang-related violence. And we went down there and all we said to the gangs in Barrowfield and elsewhere, stop doing this. The community's had enough of it. We've had enough of it. If you stop doing it, we can do other stuff and it'll be better. So we started doing football. Paul Brannigan, for instance, was heavily involved in coaching the football. We had football teams there, the gangs used to play each other. And it was amazing how it turned around because nobody wants to fight. We just, we just presume, oh, they're like that because they choose to be like that. Lots of these young men didn't choose to be like that. They did that because that was all that they knew how to do. That was all that was there. A lot of people took sport, you know, football and boxing and karate and things like that as, as a way to use that 
energy is a, is a positive mechanism to almost better themselves. My community needed someone who would talk to young people about the violence and the drugs and alcohol and using the, the power of sport. These young guys were in gangs, so we called them gangs. But they were doing the same thing as anybody else. They were gathering together with people that they liked. They liked being in their company and they did the things together. If you become disconnected then, it, it's not a good thing. You know, if you're not cared for, you don't care. So if, if some young guy is told all the time that you're, you're crap, you're rubbish, you'll never be good at this, you'll just be like your dad, you'll just be like the rest of your family, you'll just be that, lo and behold, they'll conform to exactly that expectation. Whatever you expect of them is what they'll do. So that's a powerful motivator. So if we think about that for a minute, then why don't we give them a new expectation? Why don't we say, you can be anything you want to be? What is it you want to be? You're really good at that, let's do a bit more of that. No everybody's going to be uh, an Einstein. No everybody's going to be a fabulous writer. No everybody's going to be, that doesn't need to be like that. We all have different skills that we bring along. So we need to start to see people as assets and we need to see the positive things about them rather than the negative things. If you, looked at, if you looked at Paul Brannigan, you would say, oh, that boy's got a previous conviction for gangs and violence. Well, he's also got a BAFTA, you know? So there's something, there's another way of looking at that. And I think that's the same in lesser degrees with, with everybody. So it's about giving young people that opportunity. I found it fascinating, um, you know, that we had you know, somebody with a gold medal from the community, which no one ever knew about. There is nothing there telling you about Bobby, there's nothing to show the great work and effort that the guy put in to get where he got to. I think with stories like Bobby's and stories like myself, you know, if we highlight these stories then we can change people's ways of thinking and give them inspiration and aspirations. 300 fights over a long career and a pleasure to meet him and it's a pleasure to announce him into the Scottish Boxing Hall of Fame. Bobby Mallon. Nebraska. John Napolsky to come up and make a presentation. In 2012, Bobby was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. A generation later, his story is finally gaining the recognition it deserves. But still today, many of the champions of Barrafield find themselves absent from the history books. A few of the ex-boxers who knew and fought beside Bobby still get together to recount their stories and remember those who once were champions. Making friends of former foes, that's the motto of the Scottish Ex-Boxers Association. How many sports do you see? Do you see two guys contesting over, say, say, six rounds, eight rounds, ten rounds? And at the end of the contest, how many people do you see they respect each other? You see them cuddling each other and shaking hands. You don't see that in any other sport. Me, I just like to come along and have a laugh with the boys that I've not seen for years. Some of the boys, like here today, I box in the same team as them. Way back in the 60s. It's great to see them all again. But we didn't see enough of like Bobby, you know, messing him up. We need to make sure that these people are remembered for the right reasons and for the reasons being, you know, he's an inspirational guy and despite, you know, all the stuff that could have held him back. And I'm happy that we can talk about somebody like Bobby and, you know, get his story out there. You go along Barrafield Street, three, four hundred kids, you ask them about Bobby and they'll not have a clue. Well, lo and behold, Bobby Marlin wins gold. His fists were his weapons. His arms were his shield. He brought the medal back to Glasgow and to the people of Barrafield.